This is the podcast about the meaning of concepts in business. All right, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our one more, or actually the first uh, podcast this year of Biz Culture. And this is me, Brigitte, again, and I welcome everyone. And I'd also like to welcome our very nice guest from far, far away today from the US, David Sommerfleck, who is a digital marketing specialist. And I'm very happy to have him in our conversation today. So uh, should I say good morning then to you, David? Yes, it is. It's morning here in the US. It's around 1030 in the morning. So I've already had my strong tea for you. Okay, that's good. That's very good. Yes, I see that it's very light. And that today here we already have late evening, so it's already dark. But uh, but it's very nice, yes, that you joined us this early morning and you had your tea. So I'm hoping for a very nice conversation. We're going to touch upon different kinds of uh, subjects today, of course, not going too far away from digital marketing, which is kind of the key today. But I'd like to introduce everyone to the topic or kind of the, the, the title of today. We're going to be speaking about, let's say, this power of a deliberate intention in business. And we're going to, to you know, uh, look from, uh, at it from different kinds of perspectives. But David, first of all, what I'd like to hear, I know that you have this, um, you have had this kind of journey of yours, your career path, because as far as I know, you've been a web developer, a copywriter, editor, and you worked in a private firm, and uh, now you have your own business. So could you just maybe shortly just tell us about your journey and how did you end up where you are at the moment? What's your story? Sure. Well, basically, um, to summarize as, as quickly as I can, and if you want me to go into more detail in any one of these areas, just let me know. But uh, I, originally, I went to college to be a writer. I was studying Shakespeare and Chaucer and uh, medieval journalism, and that was my passion. But I worked several internships while in college and quickly realized that in the geographic area where I was, there were not that many uh, positions for writers or editors. And so I interned at several newspapers and magazines in, in college. I began working part time as a web developer using SEO because back in the mid 90s, it was extremely new. And when I graduated from college, I had already some experience in web design and SEO, but I was also a pretty good copywriter. So I went uh, to marketing agencies right out of college. I already had experience working with small business owner clients and with web design and SEO. So I was kind of what you would call a double threat because I could work in web and also write all the content and was very familiar with SEO and different approaches, which back in the mid nineties was, you know, still very new and very few people could do that. So, um, I worked for marketing agencies off and on for about 20 to 25 years. And then in, in between those positions, I would work as an independent consultant or freelancer working with business owners. So I had to learn over time to apply the structures and the methodologies and approaches of the much larger corporate agencies to working as an individual. And that took me several years to learn how to implement in between these much larger marketing agency positions. All right. So I see that uh, I, I like how you said that you were the double threat. And I kind of also relate to this uh, whole idea, you know, when you said at the very beginning that you studied Shakespeare, Chaucer, and, and uh, all these kinds of, you know, great writers. I remember I studied them myself. So it's kind of, you know, it's it's a huge asset, I guess, you know, for any kind of, you know, special It is. Mm -hmm. And the irony is as I get older and work with fewer clients and more deliberately, I'm going back to my love of literature mm -hmm. and 
trying to go back and uh, resuscitate that love and give it new life. So I've gone back to reading more poetry and more literature and uh, trying to rekindle that passion and work more in writing and, you know, fewer clients um, <laughs> specifically for multiple reasons that, you know, if we can talk about it, I'm happy to get into that later. Oh, definitely. On. Yes. We're going to touch upon that because I think that that's, uh, I remember from our kind of first talk, you know, I, I, I really thought about it a lot. So I'm going to ask you questions about that for sure. Uh, but let us maybe, uh, let's begin from, uh, from perhaps the basic, you know, here. Um, it presented you as now, you know, the, the digital marketing specialist. Uh, so how, what's digital marketing for you? Because I mean, we hear this, these keywords nonstop on a daily right. basis. I guess every business person, more or less, they are somehow aware what is it or what is it not. So how do you understand it? What is it for you? What is it for your business? And, and maybe your perspective. Right. It's very important uh, to look at things from perspective, from an informed perspective. And it's very important equally to look at whatever subject matter you're looking at in context. In context, it's extremely important. You might hear someone say something and it could register with you in a particular way, but if it's taken out of context or said in the wrong or inappropriate environment or something like that, it could have an entirely different meaning. Mm -hmm. So most people, when they think of the internet or internet marketing or online marketing or digital marketing, they think of, I'm going to go to Wix or Weebly or Squarespace mm -hmm. or whatever and just get a website. And now I will immediately be number one in Google and I'll have a million phone calls and you'll see me on Shark Tank or Dragon's Den and I'll be this incredible celebrity. And that's not the real world. That's an ide idealization or idealization of what we want. It's what I call the consumer fast food mentality. That's not business. That's the mm -hmm. fantasy realm. When we look at growing a business, you, whether you call it internet marketing or online marketing, or in my case, digital marketing, it's using the internet and modern internet related tools to expand your reach. That is not immediate. It's not overnight. It is seldom, if ever, done successfully for free. Very seldom is it ever done without the assistance of experts. Now, the reason for that is because you're using, ideally, you're using multiple tools to accomplish a complicated task, to achieve a goal. The goal is you want more money, you want more customers for your business, or more clients for the services you provide. Now, if we talk about the terms, it's important to understand terminology when you're a business owner, because as you indicated, business owners who are new to this get lost in the weeds, they get lost in these, these, these terms, and they're missing the, the forest while they're staring at the trees. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? When I say digital marketing, I'm talking about using online marketing tools in addition to digital tools. So let's be specific and talk about what we need to know. Um, if, you, if you look at the internet, if you look at websites, when the internet was beginning in the mid 90s, maybe a little bit earlier, give or take a few years, it depends. If you look at the internet when it was starting out, especially with government websites and large organization websites, they referred to their company websites as portals. Portals, a portal through which different things could be accomplished, but also through which different mediums went through. So the website would use search engine optimization, 
or SEO. So it could achieve a good ranking in Yahoo and Google and Bing and, and DuckDuckGo and all these other search engines. So it would use SEO. It would use e-commerce so that it could accept payments so that you could pay bills and that you could make payments on other services or products. Mm -hmm. It would use content marketing so that it would have the type of content that you needed to solve your problems. It uh, had the design that would allow you to use it, but also uh, it used um, user interface or UI or UX so that it, you could find what you wanted quickly and easily in the menu systems. It would uh, use what's called PPC or pay-per-click, which is basically online advertising for those who don't know. Then it would be branded to fit with the larger company so that everything looked cohesive, everything made sense visually. You wouldn't want to have a type of business producing content or ideas that didn't fit the brand. Mm -hmm. So all of these things would go through the company website together as a whole. So you would go to the company website to pay your bills, to, to look at how much you owe, to download forms, to check on the status of an order, to, to communicate with company uh, uh, employees. I've seen people use their company website so that employees would clock in they would go to the office, it would track their location with GPS technology, they would get text message reminders. There's no limit to what you can do to automate processes and procedures, but everything would go through the company website. Most business owners, when we talk to them today, they see websites as static, one and done single items. That's not delivering on even half of the potential of the technology and the value that could be given to them. So it's extremely important if you're a moral, ethical, digital marketing professional, you want the company you work with to maximize their returns on investment to get the most that they possibly can from your time. And if they don't see that or don't understand that, or think, you know, digital marketing is for teenagers or something, you can't really help them. Oh, of course. And, and the problem, though, is that that mindset is still very prevalent, even though we're in, you know, 2022 now, and we're still in the grip of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very sad for me when I see businesses you wish you could help, but you know intellectually you can't. You know, when COVID began, I remember, you know, my wife and I wanted to order groceries from local suppliers and we couldn't, mm -hmm. we literally could not because none of them provided home delivery. No one would take uh, payments online. Mm -hmm. Even the local Walmart wouldn't do it. And we would see in the news about local pubs and restaurants that were going out of business but none of them would offer home delivery. What can I do? No, I can't help them. at that moment. Yes. And then the people you can't help them because they can't, they could not see it themselves. So you couldn't help them. Uh, I remember, you know, back then I had a very long goatee. So uh, even the barbers would not take online payment. You couldn't book your appointment. You'd have to go and sit and wait all day long. Mm -hmm. And maybe the barber could see you in three or four hours, which is ridiculous. Of course. But women could go to hair salons and book an appointment online and pay online. But for a man, no, you sit and you wait all day long, mm -hmm. which is crazy. So my point is that for digital marketing, we want to be able to help businesses across a broad spectrum of services. So the point is to find the pain that they're experiencing and the ways in which they'd like to go, diagnose the issues holding them back, and then step in and make it happen, if they can mm -hmm. see it. Well, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, if you're the kind of business person, let's say maybe you're an new business business person or even if you're kind of experienced when you have had your business for some time and you decided kind of all right i now need that kind of help i need this uh, maybe website improving i need the search engine whatever you know all these things 
and uh, you kind of feel these the pain points you know you you kind of feel where's the problem but you have no idea how how to deal with that so you kind of you know you right. fall. so then i'm imagining that the client approaches you they say uh, all right david you know we have this 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 so how 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 does it begin like what what, what do, do you educate them first do you, do you speak to them first how does it begin because usually you know if if i have no idea what i'm doing i mean i kind of have the feeling but so how does it work then you know where where do you start right i think what you just said is really key mm -hmm. where you said the business owner has no idea where to begin so let's get real if you are a doctor a lawyer, an accountant, a dentist, a mechanic, whatever it is, an optician, mm -hmm. unless you are already an expert in SEO, e commerce, content marketing, design, PPC, branding, website security, hosting, you're not going to know how to approach all of these elements that go through the website mm -hmm. in the right order and in the right way. So for though, for that reason, if not others, the free do it yourself template builders don't deliver the results that business owners need. In my opinion, and based on my experience, I've never seen it happen. In 25 plus years that I've been doing this, I've never yet in one instance, seen a business making money real profit and using a free template. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. It's because of that reason that you you articulated, they don't know how to put all these elements together in the right order and in the right context in order to generate profits. So what do I do? Do you need to educate the client? Of course you do. Just mm -hmm. as if you go to a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, they have a process by which they first screen you to make sure that they can help you, then they have a way of onboarding you or training you in how they work. If they don't have these processes in place, they can't help you, but also it creates all kinds of problems for them, where they have people who can't pay or don't know what they want or, you know, and so on. You would never dream of going to a doctor and say, this is how much it should cost. This is what tools you should use. This is how long it should take. This is what it should look like. But businesses do it every day when they send out RFPs telling professionals what tools to use, how much it should take, how long it should take. It should be easy on and on and on. It's, it's crazy, but they still do it every day. When I get RFPs, I tell them, thank you so much. I would be well, I'd be happy to schedule a virtual cup of coffee with you mm -hmm. or a cup of tea. So we can discuss things like adults, but don't come and tell me this is how you have to do it. That's, exactly. you know, but what I do is first I have a free video consultation call mm -hmm. where I talk to the potential client mm -hmm. and say, tell me what problems you're experiencing. Do these problems have any value to you or do you just want to vent? How long have you been experiencing these problems? Is this a real pain? Is it holding you back from growing? Mm -hmm. How do you know this? Right? Who else is involved? What's it costing you? Do you know? What are your competitors doing that you're not doing? How do you know that? So in a lot of cases, when I ask them these questions, I already know the answers. Mm -hmm. And, but I have to ask these questions in order to get them to realize that they do have problems that are holding them back, that are costly, that are restraining them from being self-sustaining. You know, if you have a family who you're trying to take care of and support, then whether or not you grow should be extremely important to you. Mm -hmm. But if you talk to many business owners about the problems they're experiencing, they'll tell you everything is just great, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's not reality. So I'm trying to get them to be truthful and open with me. Mm 
so I can begin diagnosing problems. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, here's how I would do it. Here are the tools I would use. Here are the processes I would implement to help them. But if I tell the client or the potential client at that point, you need to do this for your SEO, then you need to use this tool for your e-commerce, then you need to do this for your, your content marketing. They have no idea what I'm talking about. They'll go try to do it themselves for free, or they have no idea what I'm talking about, and it would be overwhelming. And I've done that before. And, it, and they always tell me, yeah, it's completely overwhelming that we have nowhere, no idea where to begin. Mm -hmm. So you want to screen them for fit to see how real is this perceived problem to them? Are they willing and able to take action? Do they have realistic expectations for what a budget should be? In most cases, they don't. Mm -hmm. So you have to explain to them how budgets work. And that's a whole other topic I can talk about if you want. Then if I see that they are a good fit, it could also be a temperament issue. Are they easy to communicate with? Are they micromanaging or controlling? Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I don't want to work with that. I want someone who's easy to work with. I'm not 18 years old. I need someone who you know I could communicate with in a professional manner. So first you screen to see if they're a good fit for, for you. Then you onboard them. And that could take two or three conversations in and of itself, where we basically train them in how we work, how I deliver the outcomes that they need, what that process looks like. Mm -hmm. During that process, we go over budgets, SEO, e-commerce, and all of these other concepts to make sure that they understand them, but also see the value in using them. Because at the end of the day, in order for a consultant, in this case, a digital marketing expert, to help the business owner, it's a partnership. So Definitely. I have to be able to work with them. Mm -hmm. And and I think that, you know, in this, what I'm hearing at the moment, I guess that I suppose that that's kind of the key, uh, you know, getting a client to acknowledge their situation and acknowledge their problems, you know. Yeah. I think that in a lot of cases, they don't want to because yeah, it's, it's because I mean, who wants to see that there are problems? Who wants to get, uh, admit that? I, I guess they know that. Right. Like, yeah. Right. It's it's painful. Mm -hmm. It's humiliating. It's degrading. I, I, I had a business go out of business. I had a business go down. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel good. It was embarrassing for me. I felt terrible. Um, it was very disappointing. I had put in a lot of work, many, many hours of work, uh, trying to build partnerships and alliances, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So you don't always want to say it's failing. Of course. But you also have to be a realist and say, look, I have family members counting on me to pay the rent or the mortgage. Is this serious enough that you're willing to put your pride aside and do what needs to be done? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love animals. And I remember going to an animal shelter once and meeting the owner. And I said, you know, I love the shelter. It's beautiful. I love the animals. Uh, you know, I want to adopt one. Um, I said, you know, I noticed you didn't have a website. Would you be interested? I'd be happy to help you. But you'd have to be willing to let me, you know, create the website and, and write the content. And then we'd have to be able to work together and everything. But I could help you get more fan, you know, people to adopt the, the pets. And she said, Oh, no, I could never do that. I said, Why? That's terrible. She said, Well, I need to be in control of everything. I said, Yeah, but the animals that you want to find families for, you have to get rid of them, because you can't find homes. She's, well, I guess that's the way it has to be. She couldn't put her ego aside. And it's terrible. You know, and here I was thinking in my mind, oh, man, there's so much I could do to help you. I could find all kinds of people. You know, I could show you things that you'd never dream of to, to, you know, there's so many partnerships that you could be forming. There's so many avenues that we could exploit. She wasn't interested. She couldn't see it for herself. So you had to let it go. 
No, of course. I mean, if the person is so resistant, you know, towards these kinds of things, so then you can help them as much as you want, but you will never get in any kind of result because that just, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I uh, also, I wrote a blog post on this because one day I was doing some research. I don't remember how I found this, but there was research conducted by a psychologist named Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I, 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 she did some landmark research in what she calls the stages of denial. Mm -hmm. And these are the stages of denial that people go through when mm -hmm. they lose someone they love. I looked at the stages of denial and I said, oh my goodness, these, these mirror almost identically the stages of denial that I see business owners go through. Mm -hmm. everything has to be free, everything has to be cheap or $5. I can only use family members. Um, I can only work with people whom I already know. Um, it's not a problem. I can do everything myself for free. On and on and on. This can go on for years and years and years until they finally come to the point um, where it's called acceptance. Mm -hmm. They recognize that this is a serious problem that's hurting them. And they're willing to put aside their fears, their, in, their concerns, the, the cheap, the poor, the broke, the, I have to use family members only, all these excuses and fears. They're willing to put it aside to say, okay, I trust you. Now I want you to take me from point A to point B so I can achieve these goals. I'm finally at this point where I can let go and let you in to help me. When they're at that final stage of acceptance, then you can help them. And it's the same way that Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, it's the same thing that she discovered where she was counseling people who were in denial over the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. When they finally could accept that their loved one was gone, then they could begin healing. So yes, obviously, of course, it's different for the for the business owner. But the stages are the same. But this, of course, I mean, they're very human like, I guess that you have. Yeah, to when you can look at yourself in the mirror, and say failure is painful, it's humiliating, but I can own it. When you can own and accept failure, then you can be helped. It's like in the military, they say that first they have to break you down before they can build you back up. They have to humiliate you and, and teach you to take orders and set aside your, your, your pride before they can really help you and teach you all these things that they want you to know. So it's like that with business owners until you can get them to put these uh, hesitancies aside, you cannot help them. And there's so much that goes into this. So for me, I, you know, as I got older and matured, I wanted to work with fewer clients because I could take my time and truly legitimately help them. I don't want to work with a business owner who I cannot, you know, really turn things around with them. It's not about the money. It's about taking a business that's failing and turning it around completely and seeing that they went from almost going bankrupt to now generating profits. You know, they went from being depressed to having time to spend with their their family members now. Mm -hmm. But it's it's again, it's that's hard. what you want. I, I listen to you, and I'm you know, it's 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 a journey for you as a your own business owner. You know, your your own being yourself. You know, the the specialist, the professional as you are, you had to go through different kinds of obstacles to get where you are at the moment. You know, is saying that you also you know you you onboard the client. You, you work with clients at the beginning, you educate them, you listen to them, you know, and, uh, and then you kind of, you know, you commit to them, but only if they commit genuinely to you as well. So I guess that, you know, right. the cooperation. So in a way, it's, it's so beautiful to hear only because you had to kind of go through all these things yourself to get to the point where you are to understand the value of the work that you do. And then to admit also to yourself that, all right, I'll work with fewer clients, as you say, but I'll work with the ones who really need the help and who will be able to use it um, in a smart way, you know? Yeah. And 
very important. I'll tell you from my perspective as the digital marketing expert, I can tell, and this also would apply for business owners too. Mm -hmm. So business owners, listen up. You can tell someone who is inexperienced or amateur because they're, they don't screen you. Mm -hmm. They don't onboard you. They do not use contracts. They don't ask you about your goals. They don't do these things. That's how you can tell somebody who can't help you. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't ask you whether or not you're a good fit for them, if they don't have a criteria, then they're not going to be able to hold you to them. It's sort of like dating. If anybody in the world is good enough for you, then you're going to end up with lots of broken hearts, right? But if you have criteria and you have standards and you say, no, I can only date someone who has a good job, who has a vision for the future, who likes children, who likes animals or whatever your, whatever your interests are. If you say you're going to date anyone, then you're going to end up with broken relationships and running around in circles like a crazy person. But if you have high standards and expectations, then at least you know you will find some people, there may be fewer, but you'll find people who will match up to those criteria, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's that way with business. So, you, you know, as you can deliver more, you need more from them. They have to meet you halfway. So during the onboarding process, I always talk to clients once they are screened for fit, part of the onboarding process is to discuss with them what are called mnemonic acronyms, mm -hmm. the SWOT analysis, and then having SMART goals. And I'm sure you've heard of these terms, right? So... Yes. Mm -hmm. So for anyone listening who doesn't know what these terms mean, very briefly, the mnemonic acronyms are the SWOT analysis. The Whoever you're working with mm -hmm. should ask you, what are your strengths or your weaknesses? What are opportunities for growth in your local markets that you can perceive? And then what are the potential threats to your business from local competitors? If you have a business owner who is a potential client from, from my perspective, and they say, well, we have no competitors, that to me is a gigantic red flag. Mm -hmm. Of course they have competitors, but the fact that they don't see that means that they legitimately don't know. They have no idea about it. They them. don't know. So they're operating at a level where they're extremely new. Mm -hmm. They're not likely to be able to meet me halfway in these other areas where I need content from them, or I'm going to need feedback from them. They won't know. It could work out if they're very open and they're saying, I don't know these things, but I want to learn. Mm -hmm. I want you to help me, please. You might be able to work with them, but if they don't know who, what their strengths are, their weaknesses, their, op their opposition or what threats, uh, uh, you know, there are to them from other competitors, that's a big red flag. The other acronym that I use a lot are what are their SMART goals? Do they have goals that, that are SMART? And these are goals that need to be specific, measurable, attainable, which really means realistic, relevant to them, and then time bound. A lot of times you'll hear from business owners, well, what are your, what are your goals? I want to be a millionaire and I want to be rich as quickly as possible. And I want to sell a million of my products, you know, within 30 days, you should be able to make it happen. And all of these unrealistic expectations. So again, that's another big red flag, you know, and, 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 for me, as somebody who's been around for a long time, it's more sad and disheartening when I see these things is, you know, it, it, it's discouraging, but you see it so often. Um, that being said, there are very large businesses that are established who don't know these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a furniture warehouse representative contact me multiple times over the course of years years went on 
And he would contact me every couple of months and ask me another question. And I'm not exaggerating. Every couple of months, he would contact me and say, well, what about this plugin? Or what about this widget? Or what do you think about this theme? Or, you know, well, how, what do you think about um, KPIs, key performance indicators? What does that mean? And finally, after several years of these questions, I emailed him back and said, you know, I'd be happy to schedule a free consultation with you so we could talk together and really see if we could be a good fit for each other moving forward. But I don't think I'm really helping you by answering one question every couple of months. You know, we could be getting down to solving your problems right now mm -hmm. and putting all of these things together at one time. And if you'd like to move forward with just a free discussion, I would do that. And I never heard from him again. That stopped it right then and there. Yeah. But I think that, you know, sometimes uh, what I wonder, um, and, and I think that you know, it, it has been kind of a, I don't know, phenomenon, whatever you call it nowadays, but I think that there's this, you know, kind of do it yourself idea that, you know, yeah. I'm going to make it myself, it's all easy, you know, what's it there, you know, just create a website, you know, using some, some WordPress or whatever, doing it very simple, some keywords, you know, uh, then, then some Instagram, I don't know, ads and something like that, Facebook. So I got it settled and then I'll just do it by myself because everything else is so expensive. So why, would I, why would I hire anyone? You know, why would I ask a specialist? Because, you know, who cares? So it's, I think it's, it's again, we have this, uh, whatever you call it, maybe a kind of, you know, this, this idea that it's all possible, you know, because it's all kind of there, you know, you can do it, you can do it, just do it. Here's the thing. Whenever there's a struggle, people kind of think like, well, why, then why do I need you? Because I have to pay you money. Right. Really? You need me because you have problems that you can't solve by yourself for free. And if you could solve them yourself for free, you would do it. Definitely. You, you know, you come to me for the same reason that you go to a doctor or a lawyer, you have a problem and you can't solve it yourself. You know, I remember, I don't remember how many years ago this was, maybe five years ago. 10 years ago, I don't remember, I went to a dentist, and he was the best dentist in town in a very rich, affluent neighborhood. And he was a young dentist who had just graduated from dental school, a very young guy, very nice and professional. And I went to him because I had read in the reviews that he was the best. Mm -hmm. So I went to him, and I'm, I needed a root canal which is very painful if you've never had it done before. I wanted to go to someone who is the best in my area. You're in a great deal of pain. The pain won't go away. You can wish, you can pray, you can, uh, Amazon actually, well, I'll get to this, I'm skipping ahead. But anyway, I asked the dentist while I was getting the root canal, and I said, listen, have you ever had people come in here and try to do their own root canal? And he said, yes. He said, if you look on Amazon, and you look up, do it yourself dental kit, or home dent, home root canal. Mm -hmm. He said, there's there are kits that you can buy on Amazon and eBay that you can do your own dental work or your own root canal. And he said, I have patients come in who do this. He said, their faces are swollen and red. He said, their gums are bleeding and infected. Their teeth look horrible, you know, like a monster. And he said, and it usually costs them thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 because I have to do surgery. I have to repair the work that they tried to do before I can come in and fix the problem. So he said, it can often go on for months like this, where I have to give them medication and anti-inflammatories. It goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So they spent, you know, $100 on a kit to solve a very painful problem that they thought they could do themselves. They made it 10 times worse, and it cost them 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So what I always say to cl potential clients is if you think, you know, hiring a digital marketing expert is expensive, wait till you see how expensive it is when you try to do it all yourself or work with an amateur. I cannot tell you how many businesses I've known that faded away like watercolors in the rain 
all of them with good ideas and kind people you'll never hear from again. I could tell stories for an hour easily mm -hmm. about businesses that I tried to help when I was younger or worked with when I was a business mentor who are long gone. They disappeared within six months or a year or two because they didn't know what they were doing and everything needed to be free or cheap or whatever. And they ended up going bankrupt or broke and they spent money in the wrong things that they shouldn't have. And they didn't want to spend money on the things that they needed help with. So they went under, you know, I don't know what the failure rate for new businesses is, is where you are, mm -hmm. but in the U S it's at least 95%, if not much higher. And with COVID the numbers are probably much higher than that. So the odds are stacked against them. So if you want to succeed, wouldn't you want an experienced, tough professional in your corner supporting you and saying, I've got this. Don't worry. You just hired the best person in the world to help you. Wouldn't you want that? Of course. I mean, it's such a sure. Sense, doesn't it seem like because even if you're an amateur business person, I mean, if you're an experienced one, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, if, if you have some sort of a common sense, you should understand that eventually, at the end of the day, even if you now, you know, you, you spend your, you will still spend money and time on an amateur specialist. Uh, at the end of the day, you're going to pay double, triple or whatever amount of money or you'll fail, you know. So I guess it's yeah, just, yeah. so many examples like that and people just still kind of hope for the best that, okay, I'll just find this, you know, way out. But it never, oh, yeah. never works. I went, I remember once, uh, you know, my wife and I love to cook. And I remember once we went to a whole, whole Foods. Do they have Whole Foods where you are? No. Okay, well, Whole Foods, you know what it is. It's a big, giant, yeah, yeah. Uh, fancy uh, grocery store chain in the U.S. I don't know where else they are. But anyway, we went to this grocery store, and very nice and very fancy. We're looking at all the gourmet food. All this is so great. And they have a cooking demonstration by a famous chef. So we're watching the cooking demonstration with the famous chef. I talk to her afterwards. I give her my business card. Okay, so two weeks go by, I get an email from the famous chef's husband, mm -hmm. the husband, he said, Oh, I'm in charge of my wife's website, blah, 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 blah. And she, he's telling me all this stuff. And I made the website. On. He said, we paid $30,000 for the website from a marketing agency. But you can't find us in Google, we're completely invisible to Google, we don't show up at all. I looked at the website, the website was broken, half of the section, half of the website looked one way, yeah. the other half of the website looked another way, it didn't look professional or sleek or anything like that at all that you would expect from a big name chef. So I said, Look, you spent $30,000 on this first website. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you number one in Google locally. And I'll fix the website that's broken. I'll fix all of these issues and I'll make it better for you. And I'll help you with a marketing plan for 10%. For 10% of what you spent. Yeah. So for $3,000, I'll fix all of your problems. He said, that I, I can't do it. I said, why can't you do it? He said, because I'm still hurting from the $30,000 that gave me this horrible website. So we'll keep in touch. Yeah, so they're still bleeding from that. I mean, so what? right, they're, they're still grieving. Mm -hmm. He's still at one of these stages of denial. And that could be the rest of his life. People spend their entire lives in denial. You know, alcoholics call being able to see things clearly a moment of clarity for businesses when they realize the pain hurts bad enough that I'll take action, then you can help them. But that being said, you know, there are also an equal number of businesses who you can help. And for them, you can see things um, like night and day. Like yeah. night and day, you know, there was an optician I went to because I, you know, for those who can't see me, I wear glasses. And I would fall asleep on my glasses. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't read in bed anymore, because I would fall asleep on my glasses so many times. And it got to be a bad situation. So I always had to get my glasses fixed. So one day the optician says, do you know anything about this web stuff? I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. 
but I'm not a little child. So if I'm going to help you, it has to be an, in an adult way. I knew them. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to them in that way. And we reached an agreement. And I said, look, I'll make it so that you they wanted to be able to bid on government contracts. Mm -hmm. One government contract could be worth tens of thousands of dollars. So I said, look, I'll work out a deal with you that you pay me this amount of money and you give me this amount of money in glasses because obviously I need glasses. My wife needs glasses. I'm going to want all kinds. I want more glasses than Elton John. That's part of the deal. So we worked out a deal. But as a result of this, we automated how they could bid on government contracts. We made them number one in Google for local opticians. That alone was huge for them because one government contract, they, they're making more than they ever spent on me, exactly. included with all the glasses. You know, so they made more money in like six months from being number one in Google and getting all these referrals that they still get to this day years later. And from getting one or two government contracts, they must have made like $60,000. So that's what keeps me interested in doing this, that, you know, my passion doesn't die. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, there is still hope for, for clients who do understand it, you know, who do want that change and who are willing to actually, you know, become a partner and invest in that, not just simply hoping, you know, that you'll do the job without any, any kind of their own financial and, and other kinds of investments. You know, I mean, it's not only financial in this case. So the commitment. Biz culture. This is the podcast about the meaning of concepts in business. I believe it's so refreshing to hear to, I guess I'll call you, you know, res responsible business owner, because, um, you know, having tons of clients, being popular among clients, you know, making money, things like that. We hear all these kinds of success stories nonstop, I guess. But actually listening to the words of a person who, first of all, understands what he's doing professionally, but second of all, taking time and actually, you know, <laughs> putting all his effort to educating the future client, you know, I guess that that's something that we have so long time ago forgotten and not that many people do that anymore. And I think that that's the key for this kind of partnership. Like you had, I love this analogy, you know, where you spoke about the relationship, you know, and how, if you're willing to find that one and only, um, you, you choose that responsibly, you know, you think about that, you make your choices. It's not that, you know, you just give yourself away. And, and I think that that's, yeah the key that we have to take we have to take that kind of message with us do you have any kind of final yeah. for us or, or some you know some golden um key message that you'd like to share with us sure one of my favorite quotes that i read a long time ago is from henry david thoreau the all the author of walden which is a it, it's just it's a great book if you've never read it mm -hmm. and um in that book the author, Henry David Thoreau says, build your castles in the air for that is where they should be. Now lay your foundation beneath it. And that's what I'm a firm believer in, putting your foundational support below that. And this is in every aspect of life. You know, before I could meet my wife, people laugh, but I had a list of the attributes that I was looking for in a life partner. When I had the list, everything became more clear. When I was, you know, when I don't have inspiration for writing, if I look at what, what's, you know, what's called a vision board, now I have a vision of what I want to write about. I know where I want to travel when I can travel the world again. Once you have a foundational understanding of what you want and what matters to you and why everything becomes much easier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can work with, you can work, you can try to chase money, but if it has no pleasure for you and no passion, then you're going to be unhappy when you get to the end of that journey at some point. It's best to be more of an adult and say, I want to be happy, but I also want to be fulfilled. You know, I don't, I don't want the fast food. 
I want the gourmet meal mm -hmm. and I want to be able to savor that and eat it slowly. And, you know, building that kind of foundation, I guess that that's, you know, something that I'm going to definitely take, you know, with me, uh, as you said, you know, building that foundation, you know, what kind of house stands without a good foundation, you know, so it's, it's just as simple, but, but, but we forget this. David, um, it's been wonderful. I mean, uh, thank you for, for, for reaching out. Thank you for, for sharing, you know, these kinds of ideas and speaking about it in such clear manner, you know, so that everyone can understand. And I think that each one of us can, whether we're business people, not business people, you know, just listeners, maybe beginners, amateurs, you know, in different kinds of spheres. I think it's, it's uh, it, these are the key values that we have to, to remind ourselves time to time. So it's, it's really, I guess, symbolic, you know, having you for our first podcast this year with a, such refreshing and I guess motivational kind of you know, uh, speech that you've given us today. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Well, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your, your, your questions. Um, you know, and I, I hope I can come back and maybe we can uh, dive deeper into some of these other related topics at some point. Definitely. It's been a pleasure. It's really, really wonderful. So I'm going to say Thank goodbye you. to all of you. And uh, David, I'm going to wish you then good day, because I know that your day is just starting. So I hope to, to speak to you soon. And I hope that our listeners are going also to enjoy. This culture. This is the podcast about the meaning of concepts in business.